British metallurgist Robert, Brian Robert, <laughs> steals everywhere in our daily life, but have you ever wondered where it comes from? I'm Brendan with TheLuxuryPergola.com, and today we're going to be talking about the history of steel. So this story starts way back in the dark times before steel was even a thing. People couldn't even imagine what steel might be. So when we start this story in the before times, we have to start with iron, because steel is mostly made out of iron. In fact, steel is actually an alloy made of iron and then a certain amount of carbon. So our story begins around 1200 BC. Now around this time, it was the end of the Bronze Age. And the reason it was called the Bronze Age is because a lot of stuff was made out of bronze. And it had been for quite some time. Until the Iron Age began. So iron slowly begins to replace bronze and smelting becomes a thing. But it is very low tech and it was done in something called a bloomery. It's kind of like a chimney pizza oven kind of situation. Now this smelting thing is what we really care about because that is how you make steel. As far as where and when iron first was smelted, we don't really know. It's been heavily debated and I'm not qualified to weigh in on that debate. So we're going to skip it. If you are one of the few people that actually know, please let us know in the comments. Regardless, iron smelting became a big thing and replaced bronze to become kind of the big cheese material, marking the end of the Bronze Age. Yeah, get out of here, Bronze Age. Nobody looks happy with a bronze medal. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> now I should stop to mention there are really two main types of iron. There's pig iron, which is basically raw iron. It's very brittle, very high carbon, and really hard to work with. And it's basically just raw iron made from smelting iron ore. The other one is wrought iron, which is very low carbon, very malleable, um, easy to work with, and really soft. And it's made by taking pig iron and reheating it to get rid of the slag, which is all the minerals and crap you don't want in there. Now that iron is a thing, that opens the door for steel. And around 600 BC, the earliest sort of mainstream steel production begins in India. But then it was called Wootz, W-O-O-T-Z. And it was made by combining wrought iron and smelting it together with carbon, which usually came from charcoal or wood. And then force is applied with a hammer to remove the slag. And this resulted in a stripy looking high carbon steel. And that striped steel is known today as Damascus. Though it's made very differently today, but more on that in a moment. And meanwhile, in China, they're actually developing really early blast furnaces. And we'll get into that later as well. So let's go back to India. And around this time, other regions started to make their own woots with various methods. Some made wind furnaces that used the monsoon winds to heat the furnace. Some used bellows to manually force air into the furnace to create the high temperatures that were needed. And woot steel became very popular, mainly because of its durability and its ability to hold an edge for weapons. It was so popular, in fact, that in 327 BC, Alexander the Great, after defeating King Porus, was rewarded not with gold or silver, but with 30 pounds of steel. Now at this point, the legendary Damascus blade became a really big deal. Now the name came from the medieval city of Damascus, Syria. In reality, it's kind of a great branding mechanism. It was the same woot steel that had been cooking up in India for centuries, just with a really catchy name. And around 200 BC, the early Han Dynasty began the process of heat treating steel, eventually developing a way to quench the cutting edge of a blade while leaving the back untreated for flexibility. And this made for very, very good weapons. And now we're gonna DeLorean into the future to 1100 AD. This fancy woot steel finally made its way to Europe and naturally it was with the most popular and branded product, the Damascus Blades. And around this time, the blast furnace makes its way into the mainstream. And around 1200, Sri Lanka became the world capital of crucible steel. With its growing adoption, steel became popular outside of just tools and weapons. Mainly steel cutlery begins to appear like forks, spoons, that kind of thing. And now we're jumping forward again to the 1700s. And around this time, a major innovation happens. Coke begins to replace wood and charcoal as a fuel for smelting. Now, Coke is a coal-based fuel with a really high carbon content. And it's made in a really interesting way. It's made by heating coal or petroleum in the absence of oxygen in a special chamber. So Coke becomes a more popular fuel for smelting. And then in 1712, English inventor Thomas Newcomen creates the first commercially successful steam engine. And this advanced a lot of industries, but notably, it improved the coal mining industry. This made the process of getting the coal for the coke a lot simpler with the steam engine. It also helped efficiency with blast furnaces, as the pump systems were originally horse operated. And then in 1751, English manufacturer Benjamin Huntsman creates the first process for high quality steel. This high quality steel was made by taking blister steel, which is kind of crappy, and heating it up in a clay crucible with a flux to remove the impurities. 
And of course that process used coke as fuel. So then the slag was removed and the molten steel was poured into casts. Now Huntsman was onto something huge, but unfortunately where he's located in Sheffield, England, the local cutlery manufacturers refused to purchase his cast steel. And the reasoning being that it was harder than the German steel that they were accustomed to using. So for a long time, having no customers in England, he exported his high quality steel primarily to France. And in turn, French cutlery became known for being really high quality. So the French started importing Huntsman's cutlery back into England. So French imported cutlery became so popular in Britain that the Sheffield cutlers who previously refused to buy the cast steel were basically forced to buy it out of self-preservation. And Huntsman, while brilliant, unfortunately did not patent his process. And here's a story for you. His secret process was nabbed by a Sheffield iron founder named Walker. Now, according to legend, Walker dressed up as a homeless beggar and stumbled into Huntsman's factory asking if he could sleep next to the fire. But what actually happened was espionage. Walker secretly stole the steelmaking process. Not a cool dude. But eventually Huntsman came out all right. He handed off his booming business to his son. But the real magic happens in the 1800s. In 1856, steel took off in a big way thanks to English inventor, Henry Bessemer. Now, Henry Bessemer's invention was probably the most major advancement in steel production to date. Bessemer's invention was a super effective way to use oxygen to reduce the carbon content of iron. And this invention was called the Bessemer Converter. People really like naming inventions after themselves. But it was called this because it converts iron into steel. So this invention blows oxygen through pig iron to remove the carbon, making it more malleable. The interaction of the carbon and the oxygen generates heat which increases the temperature of the molten iron, allowing steel makers to avoid using extra fuel. Now, if you remember before, what you had to do is take pig iron, smelt it into wrought iron, then smelt it again into steel. The Bessemer converter basically eliminates the entire wrought iron step, which makes steel production much faster and more importantly, much cheaper. Now, the Bessemer converter becomes a major breakthrough, which leads us basically to our modern steel industry. And the next two decades were huge. The Bessemer converter takes off and steel production booms. Blast furnaces were all over England. We had steel coming out of our ears. And then steel made its way to the United States. Now around this time, British metallurgist Robert Forrester Machette creates tungsten steel. And tungsten steel is used for drill bits, saw blades, things of that sort. And it's known for being extremely wear resistant. And if you go to the hardware store, you'll definitely see it. Now around this time in the United States, if you don't know, there was a civil war. And this caused the United States steel production and industry to just explode. Between 1867 and 1884, the price of steel rail dropped 80%. So with all these advancements, steel's becoming easier to make, cheaper, and more widely used. And then in 1872, Englishmen John T. Woods and John Clark file for a patent. This patent was for an acid and weather resistant iron alloy containing 30 to 35% chromium and 2% tungsten. Now, if you know what this is, kudos to you. You win, you're the big brain. You might know more about steel than me. What they created was basically the first patent for what we would know today as stainless steel. And now we're moving over to the Brooklyn Bridge. It was the first steel suspension bridge inaugurated in New York City in 1883. And then we moved to Chicago when in 1885 they made the first steel skyscraper known as the Home Insurance Building. And then in 1895, we're gonna go back to stainless steel. German chemist Hans Goldschmidt develops the aluminothermic reduction process. And this was used to develop carbon-free chromium, thus prompting a major boost in the development of stainless steel. And that research and development continues for the next 20 years. And in 1901, something big happened. Andrew Carnegie created US Steel. And if you know anything about Andrew Carnegie, you know how well this business did. It would be the first corporation ever launched to reach a value over $1 billion. And in 1907, we got a lot more technological advancement. The first commercial electric arc furnace is established in the United States. It was an alternative to the traditional blast furnace that relied on coal. And this advancement was a big thanks to some very familiar names. Sir Humphrey Davy. And if you've seen our other videos, you know about Mr. Davy because of his experimentation on electric arc welding. And Paul Harold, famously of the Halt Harold process, for the industrial development. Today, almost all stainless steel is produced using the EAF method or electric arc furnace. And at this point, it's off to the races with stainless. It's 1919, what's happening now? All of our modern cutlery and surgical tools are made out of stainless steel. 
In 1930, the Chrysler Building is completed in New York City. Now, why do we care about that? It is the first building to feature stainless steel roof cladding, which is actually still there today and still looks great. Thank you, stainless. And in the 30s, stainless kitchen sinks become common in new houses. Basically, this stuff's everywhere. And then in 1950, we get another advancement. Basic oxygen steel making is introduced, which limits impurities and can actually process scrap metal into steel. This lowers our wastage and increases efficiencies. The BOS process uses pure oxygen blown through a lance, while the Bessemer process used regular air, which is gonna contain like 70% nitrogen. And that nitrogen can negatively affect the steel quality. The BOS process would make the Bessemer process and other steel processes obsolete. Today, BOS is responsible for most of the major steel making processes in the developed world. From 1970 to 2010, the demand for stainless steel increases tenfold from three to 30 million tons. And steel's fantastic, you see it everywhere. If you drive around and start noticing where you start to see steel, it's amazing how much it defines our modern life. So, why do I care about steel? Well, when we're developing our product, we look at a huge variety of materials, and we actually use stainless steel for our base plates. And steel is a really good material for that base plate because it's incredibly strong and corrosion resistant, and it is harder than aluminum, so it's less likely to bend or warp under load. So, whatever we got wrong, drop a comment and let me know, I'm sure you will. We make pergolas here, not history books, but we thought you'd want to know a little bit about the background of steel and how it came to define the world we live in. So like, comment, and subscribe, it's free. It genuinely helps out our channel. And thank you for watching. I knew all the words. <laughs>